um, working on their poems, their stories, their plays, their screenplays. So tonight you'll see some of their best work. Um, in addition to the senior reading, they also complete a senior thesis, a senior reading list of 18 to 20 books, which tonight's readers display their favorite books over here on the piano, along with a few copies of Parallax, which is our student literary journal. So they do those things and um, they complete a senior portfolio of 15 to 20 pages of publishable work. So tonight's readers are Erin Breen, Frida Gerwitz, Becky Hirsch, Ruth Ruiz, and Kalina White. And um, Becky Hirsch is going to start us off, so please welcome her. The Working Man. Yes, Garrett Honecker, that's me. The agency told me they wanted me to speak to you directly. All right, well, I just wanted you to know that nothing's official, nothing ever went to trial, and really I quit as much as I got fired. And Elise, she, the woman, she never, there were no police statements or anything like that. I'm sure of it. Nothing ever went on record. I just wanted to be honest. That's the only reason I even... I just want everybody to be honest and upfront, and there's really no reason we can't be. I mean, it's over now, isn't it? Isn't it easier to tell you beforehand, to explain? I don't want you to have to call up Mr. Morgan and ask for references, which, I mean, you can. He always said my work ethic was diligent, but I don't want you to call him and be like, what rape? I mean, and she doesn't call it that anymore. She was, well, she was smoking back then and drinking a lot. And it's not like I'm making excuses for what happened because what happened happened. I just mean, I know there's no going back to that job or those people, and I'm not looking to change the past. I just need you to understand. I just need this job. I talked to her once on the phone because I know she doesn't want me anywhere near her. Not that there's anything official in writing or a straining order or anything like that, but just, you know, to be polite. And she's not, well, she's not calling it that anymore. Not using that word and everyone's been alerted now, now that she sent out that email. But it's just, once a woman says rape, I think it goes like that sometimes. And I'm not in contact with her anymore. It was just one call after a couple of job interviews where people threw me out, couldn't even listen, not like you. I just got to this really bad place where I needed answers from her. That might be why they put anger issues on my paper if they put that. Well, to be honest, I got angry. I did, for a while, because it was just like, how many times can this one ru woman ruin your chances at, I mean, I don't mean to, it's been hard, you know, to know how to say and what to say. I mean, women, they don't make sense sometimes. You think, I want you and I want to be with you, and you think, all I have to do is tell her that that's what women want, and then still, Things just don't always work out the way you'd think. I've put some thought into things like this, and I feel like humans are so much more complicated than the law can tell you. It's the kind of thing that really makes you rethink. Anyway, I called her up one night, and I asked her, point blank, what words and what day exactly, specifics, and I called my lawyer, and I learned my rights, my rights and my legal status. And she said she would issue a public statement and that she didn't need to sign anything because she would just take care of it, which she did, but I don't love her anymore. 
since she used me to make herself seem... I don't know. I just mean it's all over now. Except for me still being out of the job. So just to clear it all up, this is how it happened. I started on a Monday and met her that day and was attracted to her. And she made me think she wanted me too. And over a while I got to know her, two months, from November, I guess, until January 8th, which is when she told everyone that I raped her on New Year's Eve. So over the holidays, we both went to a co-worker's New Year's party. A good friend of hers, not somebody I knew really well. It turned out to be kind of a bad place. Too much to drink, you know. And she drank it. And then we had sex. But the thing is, everybody had told me how she was a girl who had a reputation as someone who'd led men on but never went anywhere with them. And she had told me some stories about her life and her relationships and all kind of messed up stuff. And when she went to bed with me, I felt good, single out, you know, important. And then the next morning, she was really out of it. So I brought her back to her place, where I'd been a couple times. And I took her in, and she seemed okay. But I didn't really know what I should do. I mean, it was emotional territory, and she was still really out of it. And she had told me about this one guy a while ago, who had stood outside her house and screamed her name half the night, and then passed down on her porch, and she'd had to drive him home. But halfway there, he started to wake up, so she left him on the side of the road. Anyway, I headed home. I spent the day messing around the house. I called my mother to start the new year off, right? I thought about her, sure. I wanted her to call me and be all, where are you? I want you. She really something sometimes. But then, it was hours later. I got a call from this guy, this guy from work, that she was in the hospital. So I got there right away, like 10 minutes later, and I wanted to see her so bad and figure out if it was something she'd already had in her system, or something she'd taken that day, or if it was something she'd taken that day maybe because of something we'd done last night. But the police came up to me and took me off to the side, you know, kind of shifty. I could tell something was going on, but honestly, I had no idea what was about to happen. How's a guy supposed to know? And then they told me she'd called 911 and said that a guy who just left her at her house had just raped her and that she'd had too much to drink and she'd driven herself to the hospital and had a nervous breakdown and that the guy who'd raped her was me. And I didn't even know what to say because I loved her. Sometimes you love someone and you think you're better because you're with them and you think you can do no wrong and then she calls it rape. God, I'm sorry, man. I don't mean to unload. It was hard to tell anyone what had happened. But I guess they figured it out. They didn't press charges. They took my statement. They called my employer. And he called me in the very next day and said I couldn't stay there anymore. They didn't want me. She'd been working there for almost 10 years. Since she was practically a kid, they said. And Nothing like this had ever happened to her before. And it was hard to know what had even happened because she didn't talk to me. But honestly, honestly, I don't want to know. You just need to understand that I, me, I got myself into this. With a woman who couldn't take responsibility for what happened. This crazy thing that happened between two adults and she blamed me. And it made my life really difficult for a while. But I've worked out what happened with the police and my old employer and the job agency and everyone. And I just want to thank you for listening. I know you probably have candidates for this position who have never been accused of rape and could tell you point blank that they would never go to a shifty New Year's Eve party and never drop off a woman hungover at her house the day after. But I can't say that. I know there are people who think Work is work, and life is life, and they're separate worlds, but I can't help thinking the worst thing she could have ever done to me, she did. And here I am, two weeks later, presenting myself to the public, handing her a resume, 
Isn't that the kind of thing they mean when they ask for determination and focus? And I mean, resolve? I may have spent 10 days in anger management courses, but I'm here now. I'm back. All I need is this job. Thank you. sleeplessly wanders as the gourd in her hands clusters to her hardened clutch. Her legs tremble with the soreness of her squat. She is weak and throbbing with bulbous might. Against the ridges of ancient walls, blood trickles towards pale, rigid toes. No pitter-patter here, only the silence of patient foes. An orifice of hers leaks against the granite of the Colosseum. The sangria joins the circle where glory was in death. A side departs another orifice and she finds some delight. And he of granulated skin walks impatiently away from his skin. His silk robe follows rummaging in the wind. The painful memories of barbaric grunts fill in his ears. And the moonlit high above them switches gears. Glory were the days of Spartacus chained and glory even and especially now in the music of her exiting blood as a final offering to the gods. The Doom. Karma made a mistake in this place, made it warmth and starlight. Then Pandora's curiosity kicked in and I watched them the night as the night went away and chaos took its place. I saw the trees bend to the will of their roots, watched them grovel before the dirt like savages. I witnessed the mountains speak in an ancient tongue, watched them erode and become nothing. I envisioned my home again, peaceful sea green and ocean blue, but now the colors had merged, split, and tangled and spurred shadowless creatures to crawl through the mist. The day was short and withered, it seized as the waves did upon the earth. Earth, here no more, where fear broke the silence of the lambs. And all the while the doom kept rising as the sheep crawled over and under its bearings, buying in unison, forming an army of unspeakable ultimatums. Thank you. She looked down at her backpack beside her and sighed before returning to her book. The wind felt nice against her bruises. It wouldn't be too long now till Ella was finished with work. He stood above her when she looked up. She inched away but didn't say a word. He gathered up her things for her and they left. They walked past the dirty streets, past the food truck Ellie was advised not to eat out of, and past the hundreds of people who would never know. Are you hungry? he asked. Ellie nodded a yes but didn't say a word. Her mouth was dry. He went off into a tiny Mexican restaurant and walked out less than two minutes later with a burrito and a soda. Ellie ate slowly as they walked home. They passed the nice looking houses and a couple of older ones until they made it to theirs. He walked in first, that was always the deal. And she waited outside until he came to get her. She walked in to the little dingy home they had. She looked in on the clothes and trash thrown on the floor. Her palms began to sweat as he followed her in. Shh, it's okay, I love you. That was always the excuse, the same string of words. Words had become just that. When mom died, the word became sorry. When he hit her, it was oops. When he snuck into her room at night to show her his friend, it went from one word to three. I love you. 
It meant a lot at the time, but as time went on, it became an excuse for him to do what he wanted, to treat her how he wanted. As usual, Ellie went into her room and did her homework. She worked on English, then came math, and then came science. She skipped her history homework, hiding her book beneath her bed. She brushed some lint off her eyelash. Ellie lay on her bed and closed her eyes for a bit. She was 14, but she looked almost 18. Genetics had cursed her with this soft, natural beauty that was slowly fading. The alarm clock on her nightstand read 4.30. Ellie closed her eyes tighter. She tossed and turned on the little twin-sized bed with the Hello Kitty bed sheets. Her eyes fluttered open as she pushed her hair behind her ears. Her body stood upright, and her feet led her towards the kitchen. On the counter, she found a list of chores she was supposed to have completed before six. She jumped a little and then got started on them. Her fingers quivered slightly as she got on her knees to clean the shower. Her nose wrinkled as she poured bleach on the toilet. The cuts on her fingers turned bright scarlet when she left the counter with a pledge. Tears rolled down her cheeks. Tears were always rolling down her cheeks. He was at the door, Jack Daniels in his eyes and stance. Ellie wasn't quite done with all her chores, he noticed. He approached her and grabbed her by the arm, then his hand found her cheek and they too turned scarlet. Ellie looked down, avoiding him and his intentions. He pulled her in close enough that Ellie could hear the thump, thump, thump in his chest. She felt a tear fall on her shirt as he his face in her hair. I love you so much, my little angel. You know that, don't you? He spoke these words often, but never meant them. Ellie had grown immune to them. Though she knew the score, she didn't, much, she didn't know anything else. Who would take a whore like herself in? Were there better things out there for her? Or was she doomed to the score lifestyle forever? Without a word, Ellie turned on her heel and trudged towards the bathroom. This was the safe haven she had grown attached to. Ellie had learned not too long ago that no matter where she was or who she was with, people always knocked before entering the bathroom. This rule was obeyed here too, even with the perverts. She stood in front of the shower, shaking. The knob was slowly turned all the way to the left, and soon Ellie found herself in a sauna. It stung a little as the water made contact with her cuts, but Ellie refused to think about all that. For a little while, Ellie was in a state of complete bliss. Here, no one could hurt her. She was back at the park on the swing set. She even had an ice cream cone. No one hit her. No one yelled. No one was. There was only Ellie, and she was fine with that. She flinched as she turned watch as she turned off the water and wrapped a towel around her naked body. In ten minutes, her guests would be here. The plan never changed. It never faltered. It only was. Quivering hands picked up the shirt he had laid out. It was silk, made for an older woman out on the town. A lazy pair of underwear and a, poor sh and a pair of short shorts to accentuate her legs and butt were also laid out. Tears began to form on the brim of her eyes, yet Ellie kept them back. His eyes and hands quickly examined her body as Ellie walked out of the bathroom. The sudden cheap cologne and more Jack Daniels lingered on her new gloves, even after he pulled away. Don't you look, darling. Why don't you come over here and give me a kiss? A pair of tainted lips pressed against hers. Ellie fought the urge to throw up. One breath, two breaths, three breaths. It would be over soon. It had to be. He poked her lips with his tongue, demanding entrance. Ellie refused at first. When his hands wrapped themselves between strands of her hair and pulled, she obliged. It poked at her tongue and her cheek and teeth, like a lizard or a fish out of water. Kiss me back, you whore. Ellie did as he asked. She knew better now. Their tongues battled before he pressed his dirty body against her, pushing her against the wall. His hands followed her bumps and ripped the shirt off. A tear rolled down her face as he yanked her shorts and panties off. Her hands grabbed at his chest and attempted to push him off, but it was no use. He misunderstood her pleas for mercy and pressed his body closer to hers. What about the visitors? He laughed at that as if it was the funniest thing on earth. He threw over his arm with no effort. This was too easy for him and that excited him. Stumbling, they made it into her room where he dumped her on the bed and began fumbling with his pants. He could see the tears streaming down her face, but that only made his bulge grow. Her tiny arms tried to shield her from him. He laughed. When her frail hands attempted to push him off, he growled and thrust himself into her. Ellie stopped moving. She became numb, became the doll they had always told her she was. Shiny, cold, unmoving, just like the porcelain dolls Mama had always collected. His grunts were not masked by her scream this time. They bounced off the walls and hit him straight in the face. Cries became softer, quieter, as Ellie accepted her fate. When he finished, he collapsed on top of her and cried. Please forgive me. I love you so much. Please forgive me, baby. The words slapped her across her tear-stained cheeks, but Ellie did not flinch. She only laid there, 
She counted her breath slowly and closed her eyes. This was not reality she tried to convince herself about. This was not what a father's love was supposed to be. The tears stopped flowing as she looked at the clock. It was 2 a.m. She sat upright. It was time, Ellie realized, for her to stop giving it to him, stop feeling sorry for herself. Ellie had her entire life bef before her, and she was letting him waste it, because she looked like her mother. No one had ever denied that. This was the reason he treated her that way, and it was not what a father's love should be. With that thought, Ellie picked up her suitcase and climbed out the window. The wind kissed her bruises and hugged her as she made her way through the city. Ellie smiled. She didn't know where she was going, but she knew it had to be better than staying home. Confused by my love to lay on the sand, evading salt-laced jellyfish waves, I imagine life on one of the craggy coasts. I'm inclined to be landlocked with leaf-crunching autumns. Um, and I started writing flash fiction pretty much this semester, and here is one of them. Lady Empathy. Amanda! The middle-aged school psychiatrist demanded. Look at me. He grew flustered and added, answer the question. With a slight twist of her neck, Amanda stared the man dead in the eye. The psychiatrist softened, a two-in-one good cop, bad cop. 
Why did you stab Harmony with your pen? Amanda frowned. Do you really want to know? For God's sakes, yes, the man responded, lifting his arms in the air along with his frustration. Because I could feel what she was thinking and it was horrible, Amanda exploded. Adrenaline coursed through her veins at the memory, and she made her hands tight, heated fists. She saw the psychiatrist fidgeting at her storm of emotions, so she took in a long stream of air. After exhaling, Amanda tilted her head and focused on jingling her stack of metallic bangles. Her mood shifts startled the psychiatrist, and he shivered. Why did you actually do it then? Amanda sucked in her cheeks and bit down hard, leaving behind imprints of her molars. She knew what he was thinking. Because her name starts with an H, she lied. The man nodded. He wrote sociopath on the notes on his official clipboard with the Board of Education seal. Okay, your dad can take you home now. Amanda left the grayscale office, contemplating how she would sell the pills he was going to prescribe her. <laughs> You want chicken out, 
Get rid of the feeling and you'll be all right. Numb it and you will be all better. You cough and correct yourself. I mean, I'll have a Coke <laughs> with whiskey. The, the bartender nod, nods and gets you the drink. You down your drink in two gulps. It burns, but it helps soften the something within you. You order another one. The napkin you've taken in your hands has become shredded to little bits. Hey, you look up. There he is. He's even more handsome close up. Hello, you squeak. He asks you if you want to sit with him and his friends. You take the offer, hopefully not too enthusiastically. You, you don't want to scare him. Your cheeks feel hot. Your mind feels loose. A small part of you wonders what he was laughing about earlier. Could it have been you? Was he mocking you? You brush the thought away and choose to focus on the feeling of glee spreading through you. He says his name is Frank. He plays lead guitar in a band, though he currently works as a paparazzo. His friends aren't much different. Different tattoos, different instruments, names you can't remember. They all laugh about places, music, books, and people you've never heard of. You, you think they must be making some of it up to sound cool. Frank seems friendly, though. At one point, he smiles at you with teeth. You're momentarily paralyzed. They get louder the more they drink their microbrewed beer. You haven't said a word. You've just been slowly drinking your whiskey and Cokes. You're focused on the flower on Frank's neck. Your vision seems to swirl around it. It is purple and bright against the shadow of his stubble. Frank notices you looking. You like my ink? He smirks. You nod. He zips open his jacket and pulls the collar away. There's not just one flower, but a plethora of brightly colored flowers trailing the right side of his neck down to his chest and beneath the collar of his white t-shirt. They are a rainbow of colors and shapes. Not thinking, you reach up and touch them. His skin is hot and smooth beneath your fingers. They're pretty, you say. He smiles at you again. God, he is beautiful. Every nerve in your body is alive and buzzing. You've never been with anyone like him. There had been Harrison with his T-bowing top chef and Ron with his slight wheeze. And how could you forget Jeremy? He had worked at Best Buy as a manager and only liked to eat Pop-Tarts and spaghetti. <laughs> they let you hide behind your fluffy pink bathrobe. Frank is exciting. You bet he lives on coffee and whiskey. You bet the rest of him is covered with inked art that he got one night on a whim. You bet he sneaks and steals and takes what he wants because he wants it. Screw your pink bathrobe and Thai food. You lean up and kiss him. He doesn't pull away. You can feel his pulse race through his flowers. Thank you. to toenail, but widen your smile despite political disruptions. Watch the static watch you back, that out-of-body experience. I dare you to challenge Obamacare and dress in camouflage, to sweeten your life with that snippet of risky freedom whilst leaving that life in the hands of a total stranger. I beg of you to flip the hourglass or turn the hand counterclockwise, regenerate and reiterate breathing back breath into meekly nature of distant myths. I wish you were the snake watching Eve ruin it for us all. I imagine your cold eyes on her naked body, fascinated by seduction. I wish you were the world without its complexities. I picture the equations rambling through your minds. And what is the equation of seduction? Does it include X and Y? On what axis do their coordinates lie? I dare you to question quantum physics and the significance of animal blooms. Do you have memory of a time, any time? Where in your memory do I and I alone lie? This is the blanket under which this old body jitters, stirs, ruffles the sheets and muscle spasms. This is the blanket, the covering. 
the covering of lies, a place where questions without proper answers make mysteries in the mind. And then part two, this is uh, called the spore. We were and always will be wreckage in a stable barn. As horses neighed in sweet passion, the heat arose engrossing a fire. Do you remember it's what you desired? Today, present fuses sublimely with future, swelling like the maturation process. You meet my roughhousing hands as the leaves ripple by and whisper what the Pope keeps hidden in his secret box. The mysteries suddenly dry up like eyes blow dried, and the air is thick with, well, air. Air again like when you were first born and you could barely open your eyes to this thing we call life. I dare you to become that which you were once before, but not now. For what is this world if we cannot sometimes take on the perspective of the blind, eyes open wide yet closed so tight? I see you galloping hopelessly with the fallen North Star. I see that which you were and not what you are. Chest pumping, blood thickening, here we are once more. But today, solely to decide, to decipher, to decode the veneer which you spore. The Dutty Wine. You sing like you know how, pumping them lips. You communicate with your hair and loosen your hips. And while your voice taps through all the darkness, you Dutty Wine. Bent knees, rolling, your head, pretending everything's fine, possessed. You sing, but more importantly, you dance shuffling your feet like a stallion's glorified prance, as if there's the least bit of chance that your weed won't flip off. That high-grade weed has nothing to do with it. This is your own creation. It's all part of the skit. The dutty wine is how you let go. It's how you look fierce without arrow and bow. Rolling, whining, churning of that stomach acid. You're so sweaty and your arms stink. You know you're looking ratchet. But you wouldn't notice all your nastiness. And if anyone asks, it ain't none of their business. But girl, that neck, you don't want it to snap. So kick your feet back. Just take a second to relax. But I'm going to tell you like it is. Weaves will fly. Legs will weaken. People might die. That's just how it is when you properly dutty why. Thank you. <laughs> sits a troubled kitten. When the sun goes down, thoughts of that strange rabbit reappear. Trying hard to forget, the kitten flees far away from where the voices can be heard, from where the rabbit waits for her. Letting go of all the hatred, removing all the confusion, the kitten runs faster and faster, further and further, only carrying peaceful memories and the pretty little song the rabbit taught her. She lies beneath a weeping willow, inhaling the scent of the lake nearby. Closing her eyes and breathing slowly, the kitten successfully escapes. Scent of Spring When the showers stop and the trees begin to sway, pause. Take a moment to pick up the flower that has fallen by your feet and take a good whiff of it. And if you sneeze, then it'll be confirmed you are allergic to sex. <laughs> <laughs> Self-help. I hear your heartbeat as I tie my hair back and feel your fingers wipe the tears away. But still, you know, the demons remain. Don't worry, the porcelain dwarf will take them away and keep them hidden until I'm strong enough to take them on alone. Thank you.
guys, so this one is an acrostic poem, which is a poem inspired by um, a painting or a photo, and it's based off one of Sydney Morgan's pieces, if any of you know her. Okay. A quiet thought. One morning, I took a nap beneath the invisible stars. The spider queen caught wind of my endeavor and sent her minions to my resting spot. Unawares, I was covered in their webbed hospitality. Sometimes shadows reflect branches that aren't there. Many can become a single one, and still more than just the split tree or parent. Hard to tell the tree from its doppelganger. In my cocooned reverie, I decided not to leave. Travel took too long. Getting up would eradicate me, and my idea was well received by a slender mosquito who passed my ear. I told him about time and about living here beneath the best day. He turned his head, a miniature owl. He got lost in the spider queen's web. Hard to leave the doppelganger tree. And the next poem is another one from my chapbook, which is on this piano amongst a bunch of other books. Yeah. <laughs> Valedictorian for Mr. Muffin. One. Pull an all-nighter in the summer uniform. A vibrant cami with jean shorts and flimsy flip-flops. Two. Promote the secret with late-night viral photographs. Three. Expose exposed skin burning with youth and bad taste. Four. Bite your lip for that dubstep silence while malnourished fingernails are brittle and break. And this one was published in Creative Communications, which is a, some anthology of poetry. Yeah. <laughs> in Angel's Park. Splintering wood is nailed together in the park filled with falsified angels. Rubber is chained to static electric metal bars in the park across from the abandoned toy factory. Firemen's poles stab into the wood chips in the park where construction sounds. Debris noiselessly floats atop the rocky stream in the park that's roped off with yellow tape.
They still talked about things, mostly her good housekeepings and his newly developed hobby for model trains, and, but nothing very thought-provoking. It was a lot of small talk. She liked him, but she didn't want to touch him. It was more of a very close friendship you have with a gerbil or a dog. <laughs> Mr. Nathan Hart was thinking about peanut butter. He very much liked peanut butter. He liked it on celery, in sandwiches, on toast, in cookies. But he especially liked it when a waitress named Ronnie served him peanut butter pie. She was a woman in her mid-thirties with red hair. There was nothing typically pretty about her. She had long red fingernails and wore large turquoise and gold earrings. Nathan liked to look at her. At first, he would just look at her. He would come to the diner every day for lunch and just look at her serve their let her serve everyone their tuna melts and milkshakes. He liked how her hair bounced. And then they started to talk. She had a thick New York accent. She talked about her cat, her chop, her ex-husband Jake, the weather, the price is right. In fact, she would talk about practically anything if you didn't shut her up. He didn't mind. Nathan always took her recommendations for the pie. Ronnie would always recommend peanut butter pie. Once she shared it with him. She sat across from him. Her foot gently grazed his ankle a few times. Nathan thought maybe he was in love, but not deep, passionate love. Puppy teenage love, if any. Though on his way to the diner the next day, he realized he had a crush on Bonnie. A simple, non-threatening crush on a younger woman. He kept telling himself that when he started to no longer show up for dinner so that he could be at the diner. He wasn't hurting anyone. The one downside was he had gained weight from all the peanut butter pie. <laughs> Nathan, look at those flowers, magnolias and calla lilies. Isn't that a bit ostentatious? Josie whispered to her husband. My back hurts, Nathan grumbled. I bet Aunt Ruthie spent a lot of money on those, a lot of money on her husband's funeral. It's tacky if you ask me, Josie said under her breath. I really should have worn my orthopedic shoes, Nathan mumbled. His black leather ones were more comfortable. It really is tacky. If you died, I would do roses. White roses. Much classier. <laughs> Constantine Hart leaned over and shushed her mother. She was in no mood for her mother's gossipy, nitpicky attitude. Constantine was in a bitter, pissed-off mood. She was visibly scowling at Uncle Marty's grave. He was as far from her thoughts as possible. The night before, Constantine had gone to sleep in her childhood bedroom in a good mood. Everything seemed to be in a good, happy balance. She didn't even mind that her feet poked out from under the quilt and the slightly unsettling poster of sync that was hung on the ceiling. Her job was good. She loved working as a flight attendant. She had just been on a flight from Atlanta to New York and a sweet old southern lady had given Constantine her grandson's number. Grandson, um, Constantine hadn't planned on using the number. She'd been dating a guy who worked as a line cook at the local jazz club. He was tall and simple. He liked to wear leather. They mainly just watched movies and made out. They could have done more, but she didn't mind movie watching. It had been calm and uncomplicated. There when she needed it. That morning, Constantine had checked her Facebook before she went downstairs to have breakfast with her parents. There had been a message from the line cook. He was saying something about how he didn't know if they were dating or not, but with her gone so often and him trying to get his cooking career off the ground, they should just be friends. It was all out of left field. All Constantine wanted to do was wring the guy's skinny neck. She hadn't liked him, but it had been nice. The part that was the most infuriating was the fact that he had done it over Facebook. He needed to get his head out of 2010 and his ass. She decided later, looking down at Great Uncle Marty's coffin. This had been the third loser in a row for Constantine. The first had been a whiny, self-pitying boy who had tried to woo her with songs and overly ambitious confessions of love. As soon as she had given in to his constant romantic pesterings, he had decided to date a bisexual college girl he had met at work. The second had been an asshole. It was just that simple. At first, she hadn't minded. Constantine had thought he was just headstrong and confident. Then she just sort of accepted it. She found it charming. He knew what he wanted, and he told her more often than not. She kind of liked it. 
But one day, when she reached out to him, he let the floodgates open. It was all about how he didn't have enough time for her, and why did she like him, and she really should know better because he was an asshole. It was like he had been saving all the asshole up for this exact moment. Constantine had thought the line hook had been different than the waiter, from the, than the whiner and the asshole, but he hadn't been. And that's what pissed her off the most. She stared down at the coffin angrily. She practically snarled down at it. Do you miss him? The youngest hard Leonard whispered to his sister. Who? Constantine spat. Great Uncle Marty, of course. Constantine just rolled her eyes at him and fidgeted with the hem of her stiff black dress. Con Leonard blushed and lowered his head self-consciously. Leonard was the only one actually thinking about Great Uncle Marty. Great Uncle Marty had been his mother's uncle. He was one of the only relatives Leonard had liked, though he had been a cranky, sarcastic pervert. <laughs> at, the mother, at the family Super Bowl party, he had taken a 10-year-old Leonard aside and showed him a picture of a naked lady he carried in his wallet. Leonard had just stared at the picture, not really knowing what to make of it. Uncle Marty had actually given Leonard an old copy of Hustler for his 13th birthday. Uncle Marty had pointed out that the girl on page 22 was his favorite. She was a bleached blonde, bent over a blue velvet couch, wearing nothing but lace top, black lace top stockings. Leonard had liked the picture, but wasn't aroused by how the woman was posed or dressed. He just assumed he didn't like the woman in the magazine. He, chuck, he chucked it up that he didn't like the stockings and blue velvet. Many years later, on his 18th birthday, Uncle Marty had taken Leonard to a strip club. A girl named Candy came with a bright red wig on and silver tassels had done a dance for Leonard to the joyous hoots of a drunken Marty. Leonard didn't feel much. At the time, he had had a girlfriend named Lola Munch. She had been a homely girl with thick glasses who was on the debate team with Leonard. So when Candy danced for Leonard, Leonard assumed his lack of reaction was from his faithfulness to Lola. When Leonard went off to college, he became friends with a boy named Stephen Quinn. Stephen was a quiet, quirky young man from Chicago. He had small, wide-set green eyes, and his hair was always oiled back from his face. He was handsome, but not conventionally so. There was something attractive about the strange symmetry of his face. Leonard and Stephen were both an intro to economics and environmental expansion. They sat together in the front row, side by side. His elbow would slightly brush against Leonard's. When this would happen, there was a strange, blood-rushing excitement that Leonard had never felt. Stephen would smile at him when this would happen. Outside of the class, they didn't have much in common, but Stephen would drag Leonard into the city for new and exciting things, like a museum wholly dedicated to cheese and clubs that had bubble dance parties. Leonard loved every second of it. Around the beginning of December, Great Uncle Marty had come out to visit Leonard. While there, Uncle Marty had admired all the college girls walking past. He kept asking if Leonard had had sex with any of them. <laughs> Leonard shook his head. While he was showing Uncle Marty his room, Stephen came by. He was especially friendly to Uncle Marty, asking about his interest in the local sports teams and how long he was in town. Though when he shook out his hand as a goodbye, Uncle Marty had just stared at it like it was covered in chicken guts. <laughs> so that's your friend Stephen, Uncle Marty had said once Stephen had left. Yeah, we do practically everything together, Leonard had replied. You need to stop hanging out with him. He's a bad influence, Uncle Marty rumbled. Bad influence? He's one of the nice kids I know. Leonard was confused. But he's not like us, Leonard, Uncle Marty had said. What do you mean he's not like us? Leonard's voice began to raise. He's not like us. What do you mean? Leonard was yelling. He's a poof, Mar Uncle Marty bellowed back. <laughs> Leonard kicked Uncle Marty out of his room after that, and after some seething and teeth gnashing, he called Stephen. Stephen came by his room. He managed to console Leonard enough to go to Patricia Wilson's Christmas party. That had been the last time Leonard had talked to Uncle Marty, though the last time he had seen him was at the obligatory family Easter get-together. He was sweating, eating a lot of ham, and staring closely at the picture of the naked lady in his wallet. Leonard knew it was probably the same picture from when he was ten. Perverted bastard. <laughs> Mr. Hart took his wife's hand. It was sweaty, and he could feel the large gem rings on her fingers. Constantine looked over at her parents. It was the first time in years she had seen them holding hands. 
Leonard looked up at the bright, hot, bright blue sky. A plane flew loudly overhead, disrupting the silence. The hearts all glanced up at it. The four of them stood, side by side, sweating through their nice blacks, wondering how much longer they would have to endure the blinding white sun. some dinner? What would you like? Pasta. Why, when should it be ready, Michael? Oh, just whenever you can. Yes. Spin around. Jump up and down. <laughs> uh, laugh with me when I laugh. Yes, Michael. are all fine. So is her vocabulary. Her response time is improving. I, I 
I don't think the police would have noticed anything. Probably just thought she was weird. A lot of her responses are just the default programming. There's a huge list of basic information, like who the president is, and what the order of the alphabet goes in, and stuff like that. And then there's the more specific things, like my name, my allergies, and my GPA. Sometimes it's weird, because I remember entering in all the information. I remember sitting and watching her download it all. But I try not to think about that. It makes it all too creepy, like I'm talking to myself. It was a truancy officer who came by here today, asking why I'd been ditching school. Two weeks now, I guess. I can barely leave the house except to pick up food. I keep reliving that day. There was this horrible smell coming out of the kitchen window. It got so much worse as I walked in the front door. I almost couldn't see her lying there, curled up on the ground, smacked down. Her hands all mangled and crunched underneath her. Underneath. Yeah. It was so. And she died like that. Greasy. Crumpled in that smell. These days we stay up all night, watching Jeopardy and eating homemade pancakes. I wake up late sometimes and find pictures of us all over the walls and all down the hallway. We dig out my old yearbooks. We're doing things the way we used to, but it's the way things are supposed to be. This robot, she makes everything. up and touched her face and it started sizzling and melted away. And underneath it was this crazy wrinkled old lady. And she hated me. No one could ever hate you, Michael. But this lady did. And well in the dream I I shoved a knife so far through her stomach that it stuck her to the living room wall. She got and touched her face. And it slid right off. And underneath it was my face. My face sitting straight back at me. so terrified when I had nightmares. But then I'd wake up and you'd be there. And you'd ask me if I wanted toast. God, Mom. It was just a dream, right? It was a crazy old night. I think someone was at the door, Michael. I know. Would you like me to get the door? No. 
Would you like me to get the door, Michael? No. Would you like to temporarily override this response? <laughs> yes. I don't understand the question, Michael. Mom? Yes, Michael? You know, I would like some food, actually. Some soup. Do you think you could make us some? We could eat together. I don't need to eat. Yeah, I know. But I want you to. You told me I wasn't supposed to eat, Michael. That it would be very bad for me. No. Well, I mean, yeah, that's what I said, but I think now, I don't think it'd be so bad for you, for both of us. Of course, Michael. Whatever you want. Thank you. My name is Michael Dougherty, and I understand somebody's been coming by my house. Yeah, I figured. Uh, look, actually, this is about my mom. Well, she's been sick since the fire. Well, she actually died this morning. Yeah, I know I should have. Would you send someone over? Yes. Want to sit on the couch? Yes, Michael. Mom? Yes. Are you angry with me? For what, Michael? For what I did to you. I think I destroyed you. You could never hurt anyone. You could never do anything wrong, Michael. I used to say that all the time. It was ridiculous back then, too. I don't understand. You could never do anything wrong, Michael. No. I did. Would you like to temporarily override this response? Yes. Experiencing technical failure. Power down. Yes, Michael. Coming.
disperse. You dispel microchips out your stomach, but always those fingers stretch for more. The globe of fattening treats hidden behind yet another door awaits your silent entry. You sputter forwards, heart trembling, fingers twitching back, breathing smoke out your lungs and into the trees. You wing it, mouth open, wide, only hoping your arrival will be welcomed. The summer molecules are too hot for your tongue, the winters are too cold, but spring is always a delight. The microorganisms within you grow stronger, and those, those hormones, those hormones rage for a slice of pizza, a Coke, and some candy. Your stomach fades. It is your only weakness of the plight of the teenage population. And this one's called Reverie Forest. Lemon dew falls from the swollen trees, slip and slide dripping onto my pickle slick hair. This place is the hideousness of midnight. I feel like rubbery trash, polished dirt on an auspicious marble floor. I stare at chandeliers of chopped light, drawn out of the moon as stars fixate on me. The streets on either side of me are stripped of their bearings. The world is empty as I stand in the shadow of the moon. Um, I am at a crossroads. Shrieks surf the wind. They banish the good. Shrieks flicker with polka dot flashes, filling with soulless creatures once slumbering. The dawn again arises with jaw cut open. The horizon is full with towering spectacles that jet forward with cheetah speed. Homeless and wretched, yet still I glisten in this checkerboard darkness. And from my lips slip lustrous phrases, cubed tight. Lemon dew from swollen trees penetrate and moisturize. From the suffocating bits of silence, this forest has become alive. And um, this last piece is from my chapbook. I had it published last year with the help of a poet, Alba Cruz Hacker, and Cat Factor. Um, it's called Surrender. Safe to say I'm sorry, to kneel down and kiss a pair of bloody feet. A word that bears little weight in the eyes of those who've heard it plenty of time. Safe to quit sometimes, to close a book and turn out the light, to throw those weights off your shoulders. Not everything has to be a fight, a lunge or a slap, a break or a crack, that leaves the body and mind in scattered pieces. <coughs> to surrender is to admit to give your body a break from the harshness of reality, to underestimate the strength of every nerve and of the heart that beats you to life. Thank you. without saying anything. Your words are stuck between my hair and my ear. The fact that you couldn't even mask your guilt makes me want to purge. I'll get rid of all the demons I've been hiding. Hell, I'll even get rid of yours because you can't seem to do that for yourself. The attendant, Violet, she's waiting for me at my door. The plastic smile she wears does not do its job to calm me. I can see the pity and fear hiding beneath it. She doesn't want to take me to solitary. She has no choice. Her eyes refuse to move my own as I glide past her and into my room. Violet clears her throat a couple of times, clearly trying to get my attention. 
Kylie, she finally manages to say. My hand stopped rummaging through my desk drawer for my iPod and I turn to face her. My first instinct is to be rude, be as nasty as I possibly can, make her cry, make her hurt as much as you made me hurt about an hour ago. As I open my mouth to release a vile comment, I can see Violet's eyes are shiny. My eyes can make out tiny tears trying so hard not to fall. Suddenly, I don't want to hurt her anymore. Yes? I just want you to know that you need to pack up. For solitary, I mean. The tears must sting. They try so hard to stay in place. Violet, I wonder if you're crying over me, or whether it's just a bad day for you. My mouth opens and words almost make it out, except at the last minute, they retreat. I simply nod my head and turn back around. My backpack lifted off the floor and onto my bed. I begin the process of packing. Although I'd never been assigned to solitary, nothing, seemed, nothing about it seemed very inviting. Everyone in the ward talked about it. It was supposed to be hell. No one, knew I was ever, no one I knew was ever banished. My heart began to pound up against my ribcage like a wild animal. Somewhere, deep inside me, I could feel a strange sensation. It was, like a million, it was like a million tiny crabs slowly crawling up the inside of my body, attempting an escape. Upstairs, little baby doll parts hurried to close the doors leading up to my brain. They knew nothing. I knew nothing. We knew nothing. It was already too late for one of us. Sooner or later, the other would take over. When that was, when that was though, none of us knew. We simply waited. I grabbed some shorts and a tank top, even a pair of sweatpants. I had absolutely no idea what to expect for solitary. I grabbed my bag of toiletries from the bathroom and finally my iPod. Then I walked out and met Violet once more. She stared at me. Her sad eyes were slightly bloodshot and I wondered whether she had been crying while I was packing. She finally took notice of me and I, and I offered her a weak smile and showed her my backpack. You might want to consider taking a sweater. I heard it's not the warmest up there was all she said while wiping the snot from her nose. Oh, okay, sure. I reply as I turn around and grab my sweater off the front of my bed. I turn around yet again to meet Violet, and this time she nods approvingly and motions for me to follow her. The little crabs have returned, only I don't remember them leaving in the first place. Slowly, my footsteps fall in rhythm with yours, and then we are walking side by side. It's strangely comforting, us walking together. I don't imagine you walking me to some strange dungeon. Instead, you were just escorting me back to the mess hall, or to therapy even. The brightly painted yellow hallways offered no sunshine into my life as I made my way to solitary. They were useless. It looked like someone had just pissed on the walls and no one bothered to clean it. Violet didn't say a single word. She just continued walking, and that made me, a f made me feel a bit uneasy. She was hiding something, although I didn't know what. It was strange behavior for her, and it just drove those little crabs crazier. The flower paintings on the wall became a blur, along with the rest of the staff we seemed to pass by. They were all judging me. I could feel it. Their faces all blurred into one, but they all wore the same expression. Some sneered at me, others looked delighted. They were all happy that they were saved for the next three days. Only one person in solit solitary at a time. Otherwise, it wouldn't be solitary, would it? Thank you. Jimmy's too weak, and Superman is busy. So, my next one, <laughs> also from my chapbook. And um, this girl, Alex Gondianco, uh, <laughs> she's a classical voice major, and she composed a song using this poem, which I will not be singing. <laughs> 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 In the spring and summer, confusion makes delusion in my water glass. In a city full of romantic ghosts, I briefly lost my sight and lived in pure enjoyment. 
Months lacking mouth sounds were cracked open by a friend's friend who knew how to meddle. And I started counting bumblebee days and hours. And then some shut again, and then no, no, unimportant, and more so. Loud, quiet, loud, quiet, loud, silent. And this last one is also from my chapbook. Apocalypse means a new beginning. Since looking beautiful up close beneath a shadow is not the same as distant beauty, sparkling in sunshine, those who had the authority to do so placed questionable bags atop our heads where we could wait out our awkward stages. Since the earth rattled during the stuffy blindness, we sought shelter in the cracks that formed in floorboards, already too old to hold so many flimsy gray cots. Ugly piles of us formed. Lucky we could not view our unsightliness. Since we were forced to remove the ties on the saline-stained bags, the filtered light floated, dancing with dust, lasers on our weak corneas. How horrible to look on others not ready for the scrutiny of terrified faces, any faces at all. Since splintered support beams crushed those who had authority, we exited the collapsed structure like an elderly person's funeral party. With squinted eyes guarded against direct sunlight, we sat beneath a thinning weeping willow where we had nowhere in the world to go.